conjugate system start? Where did it all come from? Well, Tom, I came from a tremendous club called the Dynamo Club in the old Soviet Union. Um, A.S. Prindlin, their national weightlifting coach for the juniors in 1975 to 1980, and then from 80 to 85, their senior coach developed some of the strongest men that ever lived. Uh, Yuri Vardanian, uh, Victor Sauls, it goes on and on and on. Um, and they started a program, and they used it for weightlifting, but for, for shots and sports. A lot of people don't realize, but the Dynamo Club covered 45 sports. That's not weightlifting. Um, it, but uh, if you read Super Training, it was originally, uh, you know, Dr. Uh, uh, Verfashansky talks about sport. Uh, you can see the graph he has, he has a structure. And in the structure, you know, you have strength and speed strength and speed and cardio endurance. Uh, of course, skill, flexibility, and strength endurance. And what the conjugate system did was to raise many physical qualities at the same time, which many people thought was impossible. Um, when did you first experience the conjugate system, or when did you first start reading about it? Well, you know, Tom, I read about it uh, firstly in 1982 when I uh, started getting the books of Bud Chikonigan, but I was actually doing the conjugate system like many, many people. I was doing it out of the Army in 1970. I trained by myself, as many people know, and I had a power rack and a, and a back raise machine, and so I did lots of pin, pin deadlifts, pin benches, pin squats, box squats on different heights, stand on boxes, so forth like that. I rotated. I didn't know I was doing the conjugate system, but I was doing it then. And all sports are conjugate. A fighter constantly, when he fights, he throws punches and combinations. He's got feints. He sets traps. All this is connected to a fight. And uh, so it's constantly, it's a sequence of events that must be connected. If you break that connection, you fail. Uh, basically, if the conjugate system works when you reach the top, um, it becomes much harder to make progress. If one motor skill or weakness is apparent, all gains can stop um, and, in uh, a lift, meaning in all five classical lifts, you know, the bench squat, deadlift, clean jerk, and snatch. This means several things. First, GPP. Uh, I understand a lot of people don't even understand GPP. It is general physical preparedness. Now, Tommy, you train fighters, and I know for a fact that you do lots of sled work, upper body and lower. You walk with safety squat bars while pulling sleds. You push a whirl barrel while pulling sleds. You make many, many combinations. This is all general physical preparedness. It's not SPP, folks. SPP is the actual event that you're trying to accomplish. So they do SPP in the cage, uh, or a person does it on a platform or on a ball field. Um, this is, uh, but you have to do GPP. And many people say, well, why? You know, well, the old rap, I remember Ken Lester used to say all powerlifters are out of shape, and it always disturbed me because we were doing a set of squats every minute, and we were in tremendous shape. And uh, But, you know, I'll just, I want to give you a couple quick um, um, f formulas here. Um, you know, GPP is for formula because high volume and maximum intensity is the key. We here at Westside Barbell, we do four major workouts. And, and I'll give you just an example of what type of volume it is. And for small workouts, some more. This is in a week. This, this must be. You know, people say, well, that's too much training. Well, yeah, all you football guys out there, it's common to two or three football practices a day, isn't it? You've done it for years, and you're going to continue to do it. So small workouts with the sled, walking, and safety squat bars and all. That's what I was talking about. Um, and then, you know, secondly, working weak muscle groups. I want to give you an idea of what a 800 pound squatter i mean this is a moderate this is you have to squat 800 in my gym to be official member of west side barbo we've had 83. <clears throat> well training at 80 percent and 25 lists this is 16,000 pounds all right uh, and in the squats then immediately they do 20 deadlifts with 80 percent and I'll, I'll go off a 700 pound deadlift but that, that accumulates to 11,200 pounds so we're looking at 27,200 pounds of squats and deads. And Tom, you're there every freaking day. Would you, you estimate 35 minutes this is done, correct? Uh, Tom, they yes. start warming up until they've done those, um, mm -hmm. actually 45 lifts. Then reverse hypers, four times the volume of the squat. So you're talking about 60,000 pounds. So there's 88,200 pounds. Then in the same workout, and the, the, the training is very rapid. It's nonstop. It's inverse curls. It's bell squats or bell squat deadlifts, which is a high volume, very high intensity program. Uh, some plyo swings for the legs. And I, I'm, I'm just estimating this 125,000 pounds of volume. Now for all you Olympic lifters out there, if you've got a 400 clean, 
and you're training at 80%, that would be 320 for 15 lifts. This is optimal. Um, you're doing 4,800 pounds of cleans. Uh, if you back squat uh, 600, which I hope you can, um, then 80% would be 480, and those 25 lifts would constitute 12,000 pounds. Now, you uh, you dump the reverse hypers on that is 48,000. So you're looking at when it's the same thing. When you squat and you clean and jerk and snatch or snatch, you are doing um, around 68,400. If you're not doing this, this could be very well why you're not making any progress. The volume is, you need high volume. Uh, Alexis said simply, the ones that train the most, lift the most. Alexis was right. Um, so, uh, you know, I want to bring up a point too in Olympic weightlifting, which I'm going to get into later because, like I said, uh, Furfish Shanti talked about the consciousness of basically sports activity. But when it comes to weightlifting, it's slightly different. But, you know, if, if you, a clean and jerk is basically two poles, it's a front squat, and it's a jerk. Whatever you are weakest at, that's what the lift that you're stuck with. You could front squat 500, but if you can only clean 300, you got a 300. You could clean 500, but only front squat 400, you're going to be stuck at a 400. So whatever your weakest at, that's why these lifts have to be broken up. The old Soviet Union called it sexual training. This is what the conjugate system is working all the weaknesses. Um, so, um, and so one thing we do here, Tom, is, um, Many, many small exercises. As you well know, our ratio is 80% spatial exercises. Uh, you know, we're talking rack pulls, um, and um, uh, it could be rack pulls, um, box squats, good mornings, you name it, floor press. But we have many spatial exercises, like for the hamstrings. It's, uh, it's uh, uh, calf ham glute raises, inverse curl, standing leg curl, laying curl. And the small exercises for connected tissues, band and ankle weights, uh, 200 reps a day here. We, you know, everyone knows muscles grow faster than ligaments and tendons. Well, you know what? If you know it, why don't you make sure you train ligaments and tendons to keep from having tendonitis damage and so forth. So we do these and we never have any sore elbows, any sore lower backs, or any sore um, uh, hips or anything else. So, um, and then the lower back, it's reverse hypers. We have three different machines we rotate from. Um, so it works slightly different. Uh, back raises, neck, one of my favorites, and this is going back to GPP, uh, neck harness good mornings with a sled. I go, I put a neck harness on two or three plates, go outside, bend all the way over, straighten up real slow, walk back slow, so let the weight pull me down and re, re, keep repeating. And I'm talking, I, I basically, it will blow me up if I go um, 160 or 180 yard, uh, feet two different ways, I'm pretty much blown up. Uh, so our conjugate system it basically works like that. It's it's uh, concurrent, and you were asking a question about that, Tom. Yeah, I, I wanted because people out there they get very muddled up in the conjugate system, concurrent system. Um, do you are they the same? Are they both intertwined? What is it? And I think there's a lot of bad information out there, and I'm wondering if you could clarify that for us somewhat. Well, I do think a lot of bad information out there. I've heard everything for conjugate for raw. I mean, you name it, people. The conjugate is the most used word in America. You know, I'm wearing a shirt today to represent uh, my appreciation of all the Soviet uh, Union sports science coaches. Because without their information, what's up barbell wouldn't be where it is today. And uh, we're successful in many, many sports, just not powerlifting. So um, I want, that's why I'm wearing the shirt in tribute to them. Um, so basically, to me, it works together. You know, they, they wanted you to do a certain group of small exercises that were laid out. I personally don't like that. Um, when you, um, um, like Tom, if, I, if you and I, like even a large exercise, if, I, if I'm going to pull pin three next week and I suck at it, you say, Louie, we're pulling pin three next week. I got one week to agonize over it. It's going to affect me negatively. But we go in in the morning because we make, we're, our workouts are made up at breakfast, as you well know, an hour before we go in the gym. So we go in and they decide what they're going to do, and then they, they basically do the major one. Um, our small exercises are never outlined. They go like different people are doing bell squats, or they're doing inverse core, they might be doing glute ham or rotating constantly. Uh, a whole group cannot do the same thing. We are not, we're not machines. We're not built the same way. We all don't take the same amount of oil, all right? So, or wear the same size tire. So you got to train the weakest muscle group. So it's up to the athletes here to train their cells when it comes to small exercises. And that's the key. It takes about 10 months to learn this. I've had people come here for two hours, say, oh, I know Westside. 
They've never been to West Side, and they think they know West Side. That really gets me. But I think it takes 10 months of training here to get a basic idea of West Side training. It's simple, but it's very complex. Correct, Tom? Yes. I, I think a big thing, too, that people um, underestimate, especially a lot of people come in here, is the total volume we do. Yes. The, the volume that we do is huge. Right. Why? Because a lot of people come here, they got huge weaknesses that they never knew they had until they get on the machines. Or, and you said it takes 10 months. And that's true. But if you're a novice athlete, mm. you've got a humongous selection of exercise to get through. You've got to get through the ones that are too easy or too bad. And I think that's where people fall short on. They're not willing to read or go in to read in depth to all the books and select the exercise they need to do. They want a, a cookie cutter program, which is impossible to do. Right, that's impossible. And also, like you mentioned, people come here, they're eight, even 15, 16, 18, 20. It's already too late for them to actually compete with people overseas because they started doing this at eight and 10 years old. At eight and 10 years old, they did all these small spatial exercises. It corrected the motor path problems that we have today. I have, Tom, as you well know, we have a tremendously powerful track athlete. She's always hurt. Why? She doesn't know how to train, know how to run. No one taught her how to run. She should have been taught how to run at 10 years old. We saw her coach. <laughs> I mean, rode around in a gator. I don't think a woman could walk two feet. So, and uh, that's why now we urge coaches, I urge all top coaches to train children. They have to start at eight and 10, correct the motor pathways. It's the same thing in lifting. I know overseas, um, I know that uh, Shiko, most of the guys that come to him, sorry, trained for years. They've already been, that way they can eliminate some of these small exercises. We live on small exercises, but I understand completely why they do what they do. If there's no need to do something, don't do it. And if it doesn't make you strong, don't do it. Look, can I touch upon, at the start, you said the conjugate uh, sequence system, or conjugate system, was developed for more than one sport. You said the Dynamo Club had more than one sport in them? 45. 45. <laughs> so, to me, it seems that we all know there's two ways to train, correctly and incorrectly. And once you know the correct way, it's up to the coach to take this information and put it into their own sport. It's impossible for us to write about every individual sport. You just give the outlines for them to learn. Do you think that is the biggest problem that people have understanding the system? That they read what you take for one aspect in powerlifting and they assume that that is going to work exactly for just say fighting, even though there's, you got to make the little differences yourself, but that's what they're very confused upon. Well, you've heard me say many times just about sled dragging in general. Whatever, if you're a wrestler, a, a, a fighter, a puncher, if you're a football player, a powerlifter, a rugby player, a hockey player, Put your brain in the sled and perform the sled as if you're doing your particular sport. Even though it's GPP, you want to simulate something that you're doing on, on the corner, in the ring, or on a platform. You know, we constantly try to raise this like for sports. We want to raise all spatial strengths. We work on explosive strength. We train 30 and 40 percent for a wave. Speed strength, we train 75 to 85 percent. So, um, and then, of course, 72 hours later, we do max effort. And that, you know, that day, as we well know, it's, it's 72 hours. you got 72 hours between extreme workouts, 12 or 24 between small. I mean, I used to train when I was 50 years old. I mean, I just, I was fourth in the world in the total, second in the squat. And um, I trained at least 10 times a day. Um, as I got older, you find you have to train more and not less because, it, you know, an old buffalo slows down, gets pulled out of the herd, and he gets killed by the lions. I didn't want to get pulled down and killed by the lions. So for me to keep up with guys like Chuck Vogelpohl and uh, uh, Dave Tate and uh, crazy strong guys here, I had to maintain a high work volume. Why? So I could recover. I've got a person in my gym right now that can't recover. They're all four basically got the same squat, but one can't recover. Why? I believe it's mental. You know, you just got to fight through it. So it's like a pack. If you don't keep up with the pack, that's what pack, that's what training partners are for. So you want to do many, many small workouts. Lou, is the the system we talked before we started the podcast about this, but the system you have placed in today, now there's little changes obviously you, you you evolved throughout the time, but it's still the basic system that you had with Kenny, Chuck and all of them, up to half. Is the system somewhat still the same? It's fairly the same. We constantly try to work on increasing volume. You know, remember I've talked about Leonard Zazatinsky. 
on how Leonard was the Olympic champion in 60, 64, and then his lift still made and didn't go anywhere. So the, the scientists got in his uh, logbooks, and they realized that he had not raised the volume. It actually went down, and the average percent of a one rep max went down. So they pushed it back up, and he continued to break records. Uh, you've seen uh, Wes, Wes uh, McCormick here. Mm -hmm. uh, he came up with an 800 pound squat in nine months, officially he's done uh, 850. And uh, we had a goal, we have a goal that so far has worked to a T um, to take his total 2005, it should have been 2030. But we will, we will, uh, by I believe the end year total 2100 at 165. And this is the number one 65 in America until he came here. And now he jumped up already 100, 100, over 125 pounds. And why? Because we have a plan. We constantly make Wesley do more work. And it has to be in parameters. Um, most of the training uh, for us is 75 to 85 percent. If you look at Primlum, remember what I talked about Primlum? Many people talk about his charts. I guess see people argue about it. How you could argue about one of the greatest weightlifting coaches that ever lived is beyond me. Uh, this is the first thing in 1982 I did. Um, I started following his examples of how many reps and sets and lifts per, per workout. It changed my life. And, and at that point, um, you know, that's where I realized I never knew how to control volume. I was either overtrained before me or undertrained before me. And, and then consequently, the second thing I did, I looked at, um, you know, um, in, in Marco and um, at Tan and San data on uh, lifting. I had 780 high skilled lifters. 50%. I, I read these freaking charts, guys. All you people claim you got these books. There's no way you ever read them. So, when you got these books, read it. What does the load say? It starts from 55 and goes up to 100. 50% of the train between 75 and 85%. Some people say, well, Lou, how'd you come up with that? I didn't. They did. I was smart enough to follow it. I remember Ken Lester said years ago, Louis Simmons didn't invent chains. I was the first one to use in America. Louis Simmons didn't invent bands. I was the first one to use in America. And I said, you're right, Ken. And I didn't invent toilet paper, but I'm smart enough to use it. You guys, you have to do, the, it's just common sense. Accommodating resistance, contrast training, you have to do these things. These men did not write about this stuff for nothing. Um, so this leads us on, like I talk about large spatial exercises. For me, it's rack pulls, um, you know, um, um, you know, all kinds of stuff. Like it could be rack pulls, we use three different pins with uh, three different band tensions. So we got six different assorted records. We stand on mat one or two inch, mat two inch or four inch mats. So there's two records, sumo and conventional. So there's two more. Uh, put the plates on two inch mats or four inch mats. There's four more records, and you can get sumo or conventional. So we constantly switch all these exercises constantly. Do not go in. Here you go in your weekly plan. You do not want a weekly plan. Strength is measured in time. It's not measured in weight anyhow. Uh, so, you know, like a lot of people, and the idea of the conjugate system, which we will get into for weightlifting, which is a very technical sport. Um, you want to do a lift that's actually harder than the classical lift. It makes the classical lifts easy. That's why we box squat, and, um, and that's why we um, do exercises like that, because then when we full squat, a full squat's easy compared to a box squat. And I've got a lifter here that deadlifts 900 pounds, six foot seven, legit 900 in a contest. If you put the plates four inches off the ground, he can only deadlift 810. This is a conjugate system. We took his leg drive out, made him utilize more back, which he has a, uh, compared to his legs, his back is actually weak. So we're making him, we're overloading the muscles that aren't doing the work. That's going to bring him up by spatial means. That's what the conjugate system was designed for. And exercise selection, that's based, uh, obviously, on an individual basis, but it goes by weakest. Is that how you select it for each person? Like, whatever they, <clears throat> they need the most, they do? Yeah, if you're stuck at something, like, I'm not into weightlifting shoes, but you well know we, we got uh, Joe in weightlifting shoes because his form is erratic in the squat, and we're trying to change his body leverages. You know, and, like, uh, again, like, I want to mention uh, the selection of exercises. you got to select them yourself. And don't plan them out, and and don't do easy ones. Do the hard ones. See, there there's no psychological uh, pre, um, you know precautions from doing things that are hard. You want to go in and do you do something hard, but don't wait on to do it for a week and let it dwell in your mind. It's my job at Westside basically to introduce uh, some method of training to achieve higher volume at the correct percents. That's my job. Uh, over the years, I actually have 11 United States patents and European patents on equipment that makes you strong. 
Uh, in my gym, there's nothing in my gym that doesn't make you strong. If it is, what do we do, Tom? Throw it out the door. You know, what happens at the business? Everybody's at the water cooler. Ain't nobody making any money when you're at the water cooler. So we don't have a water cooler either. So we, we only do things that work. We don't have time here at Westside. It's a private facility. And we may only have 15 people right now. Any of you lifters out there, 132 and low for around 1,500 total, give me a buzz. We got some benefits here for you, and I guarantee I can break, I'll get you to break the world record total. Um, a big thing too, Lou, I know we always touch upon it, but training partners are as important as equipment. Um, and you always rotate, well, you bring in new stimulus, whether it's equipment, <clears throat> training partners, or you get rid of training partners if they're not benefiting the place. How important is that to factor into this equation? The training partners? Yeah. Very, very important. You gotta have ass kicking training partners. It's you know, nowadays uh, the temperament of men in this country is a little bit different. I grew up and basically it was almost a fist fight every day in the gym. Almost every day. And there was money bit. You couldn't do anything without a bet. Um a uh, friend, my Chuck Vogelpool told me one day that his buddy out there at uh, Esco in Sweden was here. And I said, Chuck, it's we out there. Him. And we're the only two in the parking lot on a Sunday afternoon. And Chuck's no joke of a guy. And he gets right up in my face, puts his finger in my face. And he says, I'll tell you right now, we're having a deadlift contest tomorrow. It's me and Chester, John Stafford, 832 deadlifter. Chuck and his buddy. Um, and then um, two super heavyweights. And he says, make sure they got their gear. So the next day we had a contest. There's money down there. Well, in the end, uh, my team and his team tied. I tore my hamstring, Chuck tore his hamstring in hand, and that's when we walked out. But that's the way the gym rolled. They don't have the way no more. The temperament's different. And, you know, I, I realize it took me a while, but to be a good coach, you have to go with the athlete's temperament. If they're freaking crazy, you got to be crazy. If they're calm, you got to be calm with them. So that's how I look at training partners as a fourth. And I want to bring up some, Tom, that Yuri and most guys concentrate on where we did just the opposite, as you know. Um, Yuri, when, when he would train, he would concentrate on loading to a, uh, near a contest with the classical lifts. We do just the opposite. I mean, we don't do any squats, no regular deadlifts. We put, you know, yes, we wear gear. That's where the money is. And it's like a bank, so that's why we do it. So, but we, we don't do any classical lifts. As the contest gets up, we drop everything and do spatial exercises. We push up all those uh, for the, you know, the bench squat and the deadlift. I would do the same thing for the clean and jerk. Uh, I do, I train the clean jerk the same way because it's designed for it. 21 days out would be my circle max where you handle the biggest weight, then taper down. Uh, it's very, very important. This programming is very, very important. So, and you know, people say, well, you know, I don't know about that, Lou. How can I possibly work? <clears throat> Well, we have the greatest squatter of all time, pound for pound, uh, who out, uh, Dave Hoff, who beat Chuck Vogelpool in our gym for that title. So we have number one, number two greatest. We have the greatest powerlifter, Dave Hoff, 3,005 total. Um, he's got the greatest full meat bench. He's benched 1,000 pounds in a full meat. We have Lord Phelps, 775 at 165. Um, squat, greatest squatter. Greatest bencher, 530 at 165. Uh, and then uh, also the greatest total. So we have the greatest male and female. Uh, so if I guess I get a transgender in here, maybe I'd get the strongest transgender person too. I don't know. I have to get him a bathroom, huh? <laughs> so, but we just do more and more spatial exercises. Why? If I find out that one of my lifters have a weakness, it's only 21 days out. We need to concentrate on that lower back, hamstring, tricep, ab, trap, whatever it may be. If they're slow, maybe we'll get them to do some jumps. If they're, if they're weak, we just got to train them. So we got to work, always work on the weaknesses. It's not, and I got, you heard me say, Tom, I never criticize, I analyze. It's my job. I'm going to try to find your weakness. When you master your weakness, your strengths will take over. Lou, and here, <clears throat> powerlifting is huge, but you've trained other athletes. Have you used the same system of training for these athletes in the gym? I've trained exactly the same uh, with a higher level GPP, of course, more sleds, more jumps, um, you know, like high rep power cleans, uh, you know, a lot of jumping, like I said, more than we do. And um, um, for Mo and Butch, would you, or, uh, did you do the same? Uh, Butch actually trained almost like us, but with a lot, with, with jump, not near as much jumping as we do today. That was back in 96, but a lot of sled work. A lot of, uh, I, I trained Mo Robinson, 2004 Olympic gold medalist. Uh, she loved what we did, and there I incorporated jumps. 
but it, but from even from bitch from 96 to 2007 or 8 it was a lot more volume already for her she responded tremendously to this you know good athletes respond to this training bad athletes will just fall apart and they just won't make it but i don't care about bad athletes so and on to not bad athletes but novice athletes yeah they, they should flourish in a system like this well like i started kenny Paris at 14 he was an open world record holder I had 20 years old. I started Dave Hoff at 15, and that's where a program that I wrote called the Plan 400 Squat to 1,000 Squat. I took it off the training he did from 15 years old to 19, squat 1,005 and 19. So it doesn't matter. You know, Tom, everything we do is mathematically formulated. I'm not asking you to do what Dave Hoff does. If you squat 600, you train the same percent as an 800 pound squatter does. So you're doing exactly the amount of work that it takes to make progress without overtraining or undertraining. It's very important. Bar speed is absolute most important. So, you know, we maintain correct bar speed, whatever the max lifts you have. And, you know, when we do these spatial exercises that are much, like I said, a boss squat is way harder than a full squat. So what we really do, uh, it activates a strong function response to the central nervous system. And that's what we want. That's a learning curve. You know, you, you Tom, you used to box and fight. Uh, the guy slow so punches is one thing. Fast punches is another thing. You have to respond more keenly to a better opponent. And that's what we, we're constantly trying to make better opponents out of our training. Um, the box squat, again, is brought up. Why should they do that compared to a full squat? Uh, well, IIRT guy says there's body has 640 muscles, or does it have one? But no, regardless if he's, which way it is, one or 640, um, that you know, one muscle works together to 640 independently. You have to, why would you not want to train all muscles? What actually runs and lifts? The majority of the work is done by the hips, hamstrings, glutes, and low back. Box squats, there's nothing more superior than that to them. Um, so, you know, the same thing, uh, uh, you're going from uh, relaxed over by, come by dynamic, and some of the muscles are held static overcome by dynamic. These are the two greatest methods of training there is. Well, we have people come in here and invariably they're afraid to take their feet out, right? Mm -hmm. They won't take them out. So they take them out and the next day what do they say? Oh, I've never been so sore in my life. Because you use muscles you never use. Makes no sense. Be like using a jab. You know, you know a jab leaves everything in a fight, but you didn't throw a jab in the entire fight. Makes no sense. Um, oh, I want to see one more thing. You know, when you dead, if you, you relax, you, you dip to the bar in a modified dive, and then you explode out of there. That's exactly what box squats do. What do you say to those that say quads, big quads, lift big squats? Oh, these people are just uneducated. Um, if you put an EMG on a person, it's a hamstring. I Highest ratio I had, 60-40, 60 hamstring, 40 quad. X sprinter, and then at, the, at that time, world record holder squat before Laura, Laura Phelps came along. Her name was Laura Dodd, a police woman here in Columbus, Ohio. Um, you know, hamstrings work as extensors. You know, you don't see people call, pull quads, you see them pull hamstrings because they're the ones doing all the work. Same thing, you know, when you bench, uh, you see a lot of pec injuries, you see a lot of shoulder injuries. You see very seldom the tricep injury. That always told me you weren't working the triceps to the max or you would have more injuries. You don't want more injuries. You know, you could take care of that by doing the high rep stuff we do, but those muscles were the lagging muscles and they're the ones that have all the potential. I know my deadlift went from, just by doing box squats, my Olympic style squat was 410 from 14 to 19. Um, I started box squatting and uh, in three months, I, I Olympic squatted 450. And then a year and a half later, in a national championship, I broke the, the junior national record, 565. It's 1971. Same style squat, everything the same. Difference was I went to all box squatting. But my deadlift went from 525 to 670 at 180. And I contributed to the box squat. And you started when there was no gear. There was no gear. There is no 24 hour weigh in. I was a legit 181, not a 98 lift in the 81s. So, if I'm hearing you correctly, no matter what you do, whatever sport, raw, gear, box squats, would beat anything. It beat anything. I mean, it works for sprinting, like you said, all sports. Tom, you, you see everybody comes from all over the world here. Well, they do. They box squat. They go back and play rugby, they box squat. Uh, whatever the sport is, they box squat. You know, and, and again, people say, well, you know, it's impossible. How do, how do you uh, learn technique, which I will get into in a moment about Olympic weightlifting. But we do not do, you, you're in my gym. Do you ever see anyone do a regular deadlift? No. Our average, like I said, I mean, I like to brag about this. Top five is 890. And I don't talk, I don't count it at 925 by Vlad because he went home for five months and came back. Um, and our, our top 10 deadlift is 866. 
No one can say this. There's not no tricks in the deadlift, dudes. You got you're stronger, you're not strong. No one has got stats like that. We got so many sevens. Like our, our 98 record is 755, our 220 is 816. You know, we got deadlifters here. I've had seven women deadlift over uh, 500 pounds. The lightest being a 148. Okay? Yeah. Remember, you always switch on max every day. Use a major exercise, a rack pull, a box pull. I mean, we get this. It could be a clean, a power clean, a power snatch. Uh, pulls off boxes. What do you want to do? A board press, a rack press, a floor press. But you switch it every week. And then when you, you're going to eventually find five or six exercises that work best when you rotate back every time you break your record. And I've said this many times, but try to break it by five pounds and go on. Because five pounds, you do this once a month is 60 a year. And it ensures progress and you won't get hurt. Remember, uh, and when I say max effort, that is one rep. You go to a contest, you do one. Doing threes is not going to cut it, guys. All it does is build strength and endurance. That's all it does. So you want to get strong, you got to do max effort. Because on high volume, I, I mentioned the speed day volume, and the squats is tremendous. So on max effort, the volume is about 25% or 30% of that. But then enormous amount of spatial exercises make up the, the rest of the void. Any questions here? None left. Again, you like the rack pulls. I mean, we rotate, you know, with uh, three different pins. The, the, the plates are two and a half, four and a half, six and a half inches off the ground. The band tension can be 170, 250, or 350. Or we stand on two inch or four inch mat, or the plates are on two or four inch mat. Both sumo and conventional get records on all these. Constantly switch. I had Mariah Liggett here, PhD in exercise phys. I trained in the early 90s. Uh, Mariah at 132 had a 484 deadlift. She pulled conventional meets. In training, all sumo training. We saved her back because she's a wide squatter. And uh, we saved her back. We trained all sumo because it trains all the muscles that the conventional doesn't train. So you always want to change your stances. Uh, stances, grips, or, or um, you know, whatever. And we do a lot of static pulls. All right. I have a machine, is a static dynamic development coming out soon. I believe it's going to revolutionize strength training. But you do a lot of static work. Um, Matt Winning was here years ago. In the first meet, he couldn't pull 600. Second meet, he pulled six. And we're talking at 308. So we got him to lift the weight from the floor up to the first pin and hold it for reps. He would do threes or fives. They did many sets like that. But within a couple of years, he had 800 deadlift. That style, when you pull from one position, one pin to another, is called the Hoffman method. It arrived from Bob Hoffman. Uh, the old uh, owner of the York Barbell Club made it very pop popular doing uh, racks. We were just talking about a friend of mine, boy, Jimmy Benjamin, three-time former weightlifting champion, did tons of static work. You don't hear anyone doing static work. You know, Tommy, we know how many jiu-jitsu, judo, Muay Thai greats do we have here. They all say the same thing. There's no fundamentals in their sport. Mm -hmm. And everybody wants to bypass uh, training for weightlifting or powerlifting and jump into what the top guys are doing. It took like Chuck Vogelpohl. It took him four or five years to reach the top and then for him to stay there for 20 some. You just aren't automatically, you can't go to what Chuck Vogelpohl does. You gotta build that base. The base is huge. It's the base. If you don't have a base, you're gonna, you're gonna fall apart. You know, like good mornings. I mean, the varieties of good mornings. Uh, legs straight, legs bent, wide clamp, stance, club stance, back arch, back bent. You know, like again, board press. Uh, records on one, two, three, four, five boards with weight, uh, with the same thing with bands, 85, 125, 200 pound of band tension, with chain, 40, 80, 120, 160, as much as 200 pound of chain, or chain and band, constantly change everything you do. Uh, incline press, decline press, floor press, pin press, and then uh, I like to see people do it, my guys are a little lazy, but 40 jumps a week. If you don't like jumps in our gym, they, they replace it with the plows. Yep. So we do around four, at least 40. Um, I mean, a lot of guys, I can't even, bu I couldn't budge what they're doing, but they'll do around 40 reps twice a week in a plow swing. And let me know, so that's what, that's why they do it. How important are jumps? Uh, ports of, uh, jumps are very, very important. Uh, you know, they're very important for anyone to build explosive power, but, but people ask me why Olympic lifters do it. They do it for the automation phase of the clean and jerk. So it's very important that uh, you do jumps. You know, how many times have you brought up taste time? Because, you know, the audience probably knows I don't know how to get on a computer, but you get on there. So you got the Chinese and the Russians. They're standing and jumping up, landing on two boxes. 
back and forth, or they're standing on, on the ground and jumping up and, and landing on one box in the center, bringing legs in or bringing legs out. And they do lots and lots of jumps like that. Um, depth jumps, yay, yes or no for lifters? I like to stay away from jump jumps. I think are way too, too dangerous. Um, as you know, we talk about momentum impulse um, you know, calculations. If I, this is a 36 inch um, table. If I took a bottle, a glass bottle and drop it, it weighs a pound and may hit the floor doing 30 pounds, we'll say. So when it hits the ground, it's going to break. I'd rather apply 35 pounds of effort on this one pound, jump up and, and have deceleration. Instead of acceleration towards earth, I have deceleration and land softly. That's what I want. You know, I've talked about this in sprinting. Top sprinters put out 1,000 pounds per step. I mean, this is grueling on their bodies. That's why half a track career of a track person is injured. Two out of four years. This is insane. They need to, you know, it's a different topic. But they've got to get off less strenuous things. Spend more time. You know, you don't want to do, you know, you don't want to go in a dark alley every day. Pretty soon you won't be going in a dark alley. you be dead. So it's, that's just the way it is. You want to choose, you know, choose your training a lot smarter. You want to train smarter, not harder. Just like, um, you know, voice grace is in jiu-jitsu. It's all, it's all the same. You got to use your brain. Um, how are we going? Is that uh, pretty to clarify powerlifting fairly well, you think? Yeah. And sports? You know, again, see, he came up with sports. He would do the jumps. Um, you know, he would lift weights for strength. He would do jumps for explosive power. Uh, he did speed strength training. He did light and heavy. Uh, he did static, overcome by dynamic. He'd pull in a, a, a static bar and then run over and lift 30%. Or he would do one or two reps with 90% and run over to the 30% bar. So we have an apparatus going that's going to do all this. But so they use many realms of training. A lot of that is also contrast training. See, when we do these heavy lifts, for instance, that's why it makes, um, you know, the other lifts simple, as you well know. Or uh, personally, my best was a very low box, 12 inch box. With an old, I have a stage squat bar, 35% harder than others. I did 535 with no gear, close stance. Just opposite how I train. And I squatted 920 like an empty bar in IPF Worlds. Then I made 555 with the very same bar and as most grueling squats I'd ever done. And I went, I squatted 920 like an empty bar. And I mean, I was 50 years old and that was at time for the second best squat that year in the world. And so uh, I do hard exercises to take longer period of time than the lifts I'm trying to accomplish in a meet. So, you have, you, uh, yeah. you have any questions? Uh, I'd like to... Right. Yeah, if yeah. You could, um, kind of go over because in your new book, the Olympic Weightlifting Strength Manual, you have about fifty pages of programming. Yes. Of, in that book, and a lot of people um, don't understand it. Um, and I think I think Travis Mash is doing a great job putting out them little nuggets out there, taking stuff from it. Same with Glenn and that. But um, I'd like if you could just maybe you and Chris could talk about that for a little bit. All right. Well, one thing I'd like to do, like I said, I've already, I've already brought up because my loading come from A.S. Primlin's charts. You know, when you Olympic lifter, um, you know, it's 70 percent. It's three to six reps and um, and a, an amount of lifts in the training. A minimum is 12 and a, a maximum is 24 and 70 and 18 is optimal. I train optimally. Now, I've got lifters calling me, telling me they're doing 10, 10 lifts. That's not going to cut it. It's, it's below minimal. Uh, he says... You have a, a you know detraining if it's below or above those numbers, so you want to an eighty percent basically the optimal was fifteen, and at um and anyone that pays attention to our programming for circumax phase, the the ninety percent above is is four minimal, seven optimal, ten maximal. Tom, as you well know, when we take our circumax, which is the most important thing in this entire training cycle for us, uh, on a box we take it off a box. We, we end up doing two doubles on the way up and three singles, seven lifts. I did exactly what this man said and produced some of the strongest men that ever lived. Uh, it's all mathematics. You you don't overtrain, you don't undertrain. And then the next week we taper down, just like delayed transformation. Uh, we go down to 75%. I remember A.J. Roberts made 740 and 440 a band. The next week he just did 510 and 440. Next week, being large, he said special exercise, went to mean squat 1,205 pounds. So it's, it's basically, it's, the programming is important. Without a plan, you plan to fail. And we, I know, Tom, you said that one lady won her money back because they didn't have a program. I got 50 freaking pages of it. You know, I know a million people that claim they read managing the training of the weightlifter. <laughs> 
You know, there's also, they claim they read multi-year, uh, a system of multi-year training by Methodist. There's no way they read it. I, I guess there's a million people that read the Bible and end up going to prison too. So that's the way I look at it. They're not on what they're reading, but they're not getting anything out of it. Um, if we get into Olympic weightlifting, and you can jump in, Chris, yeah. but I want to start out, you know, about a conjugate system for Olympic weightlifting. All right? Uh, well, Olympic weightlifting, you, you need to start it at 10 years old at a minimum. You, or younger if you can. But after you perfect technique, you must raise max strength. Uh, Primo's data shows the optimal amount of lifts, like I talked about, at, at certain percents. And you have to follow those to a T. Um, you know, because, um, and this is based on the clean jerk and snatch. And again, I said like 50% of the training by their data was between 75 and 85%. These are renowned coaches. Uh, the coaches that came up with the data on the amount of lifts per percent from that you do uh, from 55 to 100 is also responsible for uh, my weight periodization that I use. Uh, lot, uh, weight periodization seems uh, quite complicated or something, but many, many sports in the Soviet Union use weight periodization. You know, I, I, to get off the point here, if you got a rugby team and you want your rugby players to squat 400, if you train like we do, you know, uh, either 75 to 85 percent or 40 to 50 with 25 percent band tension, they will maintain a 400 pound squat. Why? Because they're doing 25 efforts with the maximum force that would represent 400 pounds. It's the greatest way to do it. So that's why he came up with this. So, but here's the problem. Now, this is where guys, is, I think this is why they're doing 10 lifts and you not, not more. Because how are you going to become better at Olympic weightlifting? You have to raise the volume. How do you raise volume without losing bar speed or fatigue and so you have a distortion in form? That's what Primlum says. And also the other gentleman talks about how many lifts you do. Well, the key, now we go to the conjugate system by um, A.S. Primblum. And um, in 1975, he had started basically with 20, 25 exercises in 1972. So in this program in 1975, he's using a 10-week cycle of this. And this is authored by A.S. Primblum. I mean, A.S. Medvedes, you know, another famous coach. So if you look what he did, he started, he started uh, piecemeal programs. And basically, he was up to 60 exercises and like 25 snatches. They cut out uh, GPP. Now, a lot of people think the Bulgarians never did GPP because they handled all these heavy weights. They thought it was unnecessary. I can kind of see that by what they did. We live on GPP, all right? Um, but they did 25 snatches and cleans, pressing exercises, you know. So they all, and yielding isometric combinations, uh, and I'm going to get into this because this really ticks me off, um, you know, uh, as well as appropriate GPP when included. Uh, but it was a shock system. And what happened was over a period of five years, they went from being able to do 800 lifts to 1,300 lifts. That It's almost twice the volume. That's how they raised their lifts. So how did they do it with in the clean jerk and snatch without distorting form? They didn't. They did spatial exercises. But before we get into that program, um, I want you know, people said, what, what happens? And Tommy, you, you know, how many people see board come here and not board anymore? Why did he do the following conclusions were formulated as a result of incorporating the first piecemeal program, which went up to 100 lifts, what we'll talk about. All right. Uh, interest in workouts improved, which in turn uh, contributed to significant improvement in the work capacity of all the participants. Work capacity, raising volume. Secondly, a wide range of spatial exercise in combination with different realms of muscular work was effective in improving not only speed strength qualities and coordination in the snatch and clean and jerk. Gee, it's funny. It didn't say it distorted it. It said it helped it because it's freaking harder, guys. You know, it's harder. That's why it makes Olympic lifting easy and you can get the volume. So the unified programs basically enhanced awareness of improving technique um, since all the athletes did all the same exercises in certain groups. Well, the only difference is we pick individuals by gym, pick their own exercises. The very interesting point you bring up, Lou, because um, in talking with Dan DePasqua, I showed you the thing that Franz Bosch uh, said. Yes. And, um, he quote, he said, a motor pattern that we try to learn, we learn not from repeating that pattern over and over again, but we learn from the difference between two executions of the motor pattern. It must stay interesting from the beginning, so must vary the execution of the movement pattern to learn the difference. Transfer comes not from replicating positions. And that's exactly what you're talking about. Right. Olympic lifters in America constantly do this. They do the same thing over and over and wanting to, and different results. And they're not going to get different results. 
Tom, I, I remember Chuck Vogelpohl. Did you see my first training tapes? You got a picture of Chuck and Kenny. Chuck's a skinny kid. I said, this guy's built a pole and Kenny's built a bench. Even though they were, they were basically kids. And what did they grow into? Godzilla. They were two Bambies turned into Godzilla. And that's what happens. That's what training does. That's what adaptation to training does. Um, I know I've got my intern here. and uh, He's an Olympic weightlifter. And uh, I think Chris got some uh, questions or statements. So when you're looking at Medvedez's book, something I think will, that will help clarify some of the conjugate system for American weightlifters is it says on page 12 that prior to the implementation of the first piecemeal program, lifters employed a narrow range of exercises in training, an average of 12 plus or minus three exercises per year. What do you see, and that's very similar to what a lot of the American lifters are doing now, what are some of the issues that you see with having a very small exercise range in training? My problem is I see that where were they were in 1972 and 1976. Yeah. I mean, we've gone nowhere, and it doesn't make any sense. Mm -hmm. uh, it says right there that their conclusion, why they failed, they tell you how they succeeded. They actually gave us the key to success. I remember, I won't bring up the coach's name, but I was talking to two coaches. I said, how's American weightlifting? They said, it's terrible. And they went on and on. And then they start to tell me how great the Chinese is. Now, I respect the Chinese. These are strong dudes. But they tell me how great the Chinese is and how great, how bad we are. And so I said to them, because I finally just got really mad, and I said, as nice as I could, well, then, if the Chinese have got the answer, why don't you just follow what the Chinese do? And they just stared at me. The answer's out there, folks. You just got to accept the answers. You know, you know what the hardest thing for a human being to do is? Change. Yep. Change. You must change. If you don't change, uh, you, you, you're not going to adapt to things. They're going to die. So you and I both well know the success and the importance of having special exercise, especially related to the snatch and clean and jerk. But you and I do not think like everybody else. So clarify a little bit some of the benefits of using these special poles and things like that. In my opinion, it, perfect, it perfects technique. Right. You know what, like I said, it's like uh, my boy Jake, um, you know, Jake, he, he gets in the power rack. He pulled me the other day. I'm 68 years old. I pulled 705 easier than he did 705 off a pin. It's a 900 pound deadlifter. It's yeah. a terrible position for him. So that's that's why it's, you know, it worked on his weakness. I mean, it takes 200 pounds off his deadlift. Mm -hmm. So it's it's going to perfect technique and build. What does it say? It builds strength and special and uh, certain areas of the muscle to do all the yep. work. Mm -hmm. Because, you know, when you do a, like I said, when a guy, you know, how come, you you know, the Olympic lifters in the country, their, for, their form is just fine. But they get up, you know, you go up from 3 to 380, all of a sudden their form goes away, they can't lift the weight. Why? Mm -hmm. It's because of muscular strength. Their lower back around, the traps won't, you know, fully activate, the legs won't extend, the torso won't extend. So it's all a matter of strength. I mean, you, you're, you know, when you ever come to this conclusion, guys, because that's why they got weight, lift, weight classes in weightlifting. Bigger men lift bigger weights. Mm -hmm. So, or, or, you know, like what does Tony Remo say, Tom? Uh, bigger ain't stronger, strong is strong. Mm -hmm. So get freaking strong. Another thing I want to bring up, too, it's very vital for smaller lifters to be stronger proportionally in the legs because they must make up for error in technique because they don't have the mo body mass to control the barbell. Small if they make a small base. error, they'll dump the weight. Large men, it's up two feet. I used to look at Shane Hammond when he squat. There's a foot and a half in the front of the bar and a foot and a half behind the damn bar. I mean, no wonder the guy was, you know, built to squat. And, you know, get a little skinny guy, you know, if you just move an inch, I mean, the center mass is very small compared. Not only that, but the more special pulls you can do, the more volume you can get into your training. You increase the volume, and it kind of goes back to what you and Tom were talking about earlier. People who do the most amount of work lift the most amount of weights. Yeah, can you hear him fine? Mm -hmm. All right, listen, uh, do me a favor. Uh, well, you got that book of yours. Turn to page 46. Okay. Oh, and meanwhile, while he's doing that, you know, uh, Tommy, uh, uh, you know, conjugate system for sport. I mean, why, you know, they did all kinds of things, you know, in the beginning, gymnastics, um, aerobics, you know, games, all tied, basketball, soccer, that was big for them. Uh, ping pong, Alexis played a lot of ping pong. You know, mobility games, cycling, rowing, swimming, water sports. I, how many times have you seen them doing cross-country skiing or with backpacks and, you know, hiking? All right, why did they do all that when they're in one sport? 
GPP and they're, and it's a conjugate. You just can't you just can't do the same thing over. You get bored stiff, and uh, and, and you know what? It, uh, here at Westside Barbell, I'll put it like this: This is why you could do your couple exercises, and I'll do my hundreds. If I had a million dollars underneath the rock in the parking lot, and the non-believers would go out and pick up a rock, and it's not there, they'd go home. But smart people would pick up rocks that he found a million dollars. That's what I do. I do enough exercise as what the Soviets did because I want Chris just to read off a partial list of a hundred exercises. I mean, these are programs that Medvedev came for, up for Olympic weightlifting. Why do you need to do clean jerk and snatch? Because it won't freaking work after a while. Go ahead, Chris. Just start with a few. And and they seem odd to people. But uh, you said, you told me yourself, you pulled off boxes or pins, and after what, it got too easy. You found that standing on boxes pulling then raised everything. Yep. And, you, and, and and what did your friend, he was pulling up against the pin at a height, and, and, and just go through that real quick, and then I want you to read these. So for some of the special pulls that we would do, we would use, uh, we would pull off of boxes, but we'd also add bands just for a little bit of extra resistance, but we would set wooden dowels to either sternum or belly button height for the clean and the snatch pull. And in six weeks, uh, my training partner, his snatch went from 286 to 317. Uh, which is a direct correlation to him getting stronger in that pull. And you said that the, those pin, pulling up against the dial is basically it's the same, 30 pounds. Absolutely. And you talked to my friend Jimmy Benjamin, three-time national champion, went to the World Games and everything, Olympic weightlifting. What did he say he did this morning? He pulled up against pins and did a lot of isometrics. Yeah. In the high position, all the positions. Mm -hmm. Okay, go ahead. Uh, just read off a few of these programs so people understand. And maybe, you know, so they'll, they don't think I'm making them up. So they, they have the classical snatch and classical clean and jerk, which are way overutilized in the U.S. But they have classical snatch with leg straight, torso leaned over the bar, straight leg, straight torso snatch, standing on deficit boxes. They have muscle snatches with straight legs, close grip, wide grip, wide feet, close feet. Uh, they have cleans with four stops in the poles. Uh, plus front squats afterwards. Uh, let's see here. Push jerks behind the neck, plus overhead squats with clean grips. They have heavy jerk drives, uh, which is something that we talked to Glenn about definitely <coughs> doing. Uh, snatches from the floor, again, with the close grip, plus overhead squats afterwards. Uh, torso straight, leg straight, uh, basically changing up the starting positions constantly to like what we've talked about a lot to change the stimulus. So basically you could go on and on, but there was 100. There's 100 one exercises. of the greatest coaches in the world had 100. When Louis Simmons says do this, they say I'm out of my mind. But the greatest coach, in one of the, Medvedev is one of the greatest Olympic coaches in the world. And also, of course, this is formulated by Primlum because they used his people. So guys, mm -hmm. I'm just passing on. The only reason I even write books as to, and I refer to all the books that I've learned from to get people to read a book. And don't just read it one time. Read it and understand it. How many times, how many people uh, take our exam? I mean, it's a tough exam. And, and, and what's the failure rate on our exam? 85%. 85% failure. Now, they read these books for, for how many months? Six. Six months at a minimum. And that 85% failure rate. You just can't read it. You have to learn it. And you know what I would do in the beginning? I would be I would be stumped a bit by what's in these books. So I would go, well, what the hell are they talking about? I would go into, I would put my brain in my gym. And I go, what? Well, and then I I put the activity and what it said in the book. And I, and I feel, oh, that's what they meant. That's how I came up with it. You know, you said that. Uh, Dorian Price was here. And he wanted to learn more about strength training for Muay Thai. Uh, we're talking and talking and talking. And he could not. He's reading the books. He couldn't grasp it. Then he's like, I said, Dorian, put Muay Thai into this. Within five minutes, did he got all the questions right. Why? Because you put your sport into the system. Just like I said about sled dragging or weight, any weight training at all in the gym, you know. Um, you know, I'm huge on small exercises. You know, he just read a list of all these spatial poles, okay? Well, I remember I've talked to you before. Uh, when I was a kid, everybody would say, well, you want a bench press, Lou, uh, do close grip. That'll build up your regular bench. I said, that's a good idea. Then I got, so I did, and it, uh, everything stopped again. So I said, how can I build up a close grip? So I did extensions and so forth. The same thing in these poles. That's why we have reverse hyper extensions. We do back raises. We do, well, you know, the good mornings. They talk about those. 
but we countless ex small exercises that absolutely isolate a muscle and then it changes everything. Right now, Chris, I know you're doing static holds in my bent pendulum hyper and you think it's tremendous. Absolutely. Yeah, you know, Olympic lifters don't pull a flat back, they pull a arch backs. Should. So he's doing these exercises. His strength's going up rapidly, correct? Mm -hmm. And so that's what we're looking for. Raising, and here's a problem I see, and, um, you know, it's not so much a powerlifting. It seems like, oh, powerlifters want to max out, you know, almost maybe too often. But Olympic lifters hardly ever max out. And and also, they seem to have this idea that they need to, be, to do a percent of another lift to succeed at weightlifting. Uh, if it's a front squat, back squat, high pull, I don't care what it is, a good morning, you need to do as much as you can in every single lift. Do not hold your front squat back because you can't clean. This is insane. Uh, or back squat. You get the biggest back squat you can, the biggest front squat you can, the biggest high pull you can. I don't care how ugly you are. The name of the game when they're done and who lifted the most weight. Mm -hmm. I'm all about technique, but the strength's going to take it up. David Rigger pulled with Ben Arms. He broke 57 world records. I'm not telling you to do that, but I'm just saying he did. So Victor Saltz was this amazingly strong lifter. I know he pushed push jerk 595 at 220, and I don't, I've never heard of anyone push jerking 600. Mm -hmm. He did it at 220, and and he was one of one of Medvedev's top lifters. He was a little inconsistent, but extremely strong. You know the Russians would only send their uh, a lot of people don't realize this, but they only send their most um, um, uh, what's the word, uh, you know, uh, the more, they'd always do good. They'd take, even though you're a little stronger than me, Tom, they might send you, if, if you bombed out a third of the time, they would be reliable. They send, always send the reliable lifters. And like me, I don't like to send my lifters out if they're not in shape because it's, it's a, it's an expression of what's side barbell. You know, I, I got this from a Russian coach, but you know, I go to me and that's good. Louis, what happened? What happened? Louis, what'd you do? So now when my lifters go, Louis, 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 what happened? What did he do? They still come to me. So I don't like my guys screwing up because they come to me. All right. Uh, any more questions on this? Lou, for a coach, what, how important is it to know the differences between each special strength and how they train them? Very important. You know, uh, as you well know, Tom, you got a ton of endurance, so you're always trying to work on your maximal strength. I, uh, you know, I mean, you kill you kill the fighters down there somehow, you know. So you always want to recognize uh, explosive strength. Like if you can't jump, you need to work on. It. I know your fighters, amazingly enough, couldn't jump, but now they're jumping on 60 inch boxes. What's the record with ankle weights? Highest 52. 52 inch with 10 pound ankle weights. So you changed all that around. See, whatever they lacked at, you brought up. You know, like Dorian Price would stand six feet away from me and say, hit me. Well, how am I going to do that six feet away? I have to learn footwork to work and hit Dorian. You know, so it's, you you got to be able to get to a, a person to hit him, or you got to train on these weaknesses, or you're never going to succeed at, uh, you know, Olympic weightlifting or powerlifting or football or anything else. Um, I think it, it's important to touch a little bit on the importance of isometrics in regards to the Olympic lifts because you go through the position so fast that although people say they're working on technique, they're not working on postural strength and uh, just talking about the importance of what that is and why you need to do that. Well, in my book, I talk about isometrics. And one of the main reasons is, uh, you know, if the second poles are so explosive, you get mm -hmm. a minimal amount of work. But isometrics, you go to bar to one to three seconds if you want. Right. You, you gain a lot of work there, and it's easy for the coach. The reason the Soviets did lots of, a lot of isometrics, it's easy for the coach to analyze the lifter at that point because the barbell's not moving. Mm -hmm. It's being held static in all these different positions. Yeah. You know, they normally would do four pole positions mm -hmm. and so forth. You know, And I also did some eccentric work for Olympic lifters. You drop everything. You, you fall down the squat and you drop every barbell. That's why the Olympic lifters did eccentric squats. They did slow eccentric squats. There's no need for power lifters to do them, but Olympic lifters need to do some slow stuff, slow down. Um, I think I mentioned this before in another podcast. When I started doing this in 1972 uh, or 82, I knew that I was slow. I mean, I brought my back the second time. That's why I started reading this. But power lifters were generally slow in general. And I knew we had to be faster. A year into this, I also figured out that uh, where we need to lift weights faster, Olympic lifters need to learn to lift weights slower. And by that, I mean they, they can't lift heavy weights. When the weights, they'll look great to 350, put 360 on, they die. 
over and over and over. They said they're dead in the water. You think you see them do 350, you think they can do 400, but they can't do 360. That's, that's lack of absolute strength. So you want to train uh, to, to be able to lift weights low. That's exactly why we use bands. Yeah. People say, you can't use bands. Well, we use them here all the time. We snatch with them, clean drink. I mean, I'm just talking, you know, for the most part, yeah. I mean, CrossFitters, these aren't what you call the greatest weightlifters in the world, but they'll roll right in here, break a record in their clean and jerk and snatch, and they're doing snatches, full snatches with bands and folds with clean. You have to know how much band tension to use. You just can't take, I mean, I've done this at least around 1990, around 25 or six years of bands. I know bands. And um, if I had a lot of Olympic weightlifters, I would have different stations with bands. Like, you know, when we use a mini band one strand for speed, mm -hmm. I'd use two for max effort. You yeah. said you kind of did that, right? Yep. Yeah. You know, like, yes, Tom. What do you say to people who say bands hurt their joints? Well, we, we've had people who said that um, they stopped using bands because they thought bands was bad in their joints. I would say they're doing something sloppy because actually, when I had bad shoulder, for, I mean, it, I, it, it feels better to me to use bands than not bands. It makes me stabilize, not un, be unstable. Mm -hmm. I've heard all kinds of things. The bands will, will uh, distort your trajectory of the barbell. You are the one that controls the barbell, you, not the damn bands. Mm -hmm. You know, uh, if people saw me lift, I, I, I when I came out of back out of retirement in '48, I went, I did 16 straight squats. I never missed one and never did a hard one. I never did a full squat, and I ba I band squatted the week before on a box that I went to the meet. Not only did I full squat, I left the bands on the bar. My problem was my openers being so explosive, it was actually hard to control myself on my opener. I mean, I was brutally, you know, standing with 785, like 135. And I'm, I was an old man. That's what we found. Uh, if people ever saw Chuck Vogue pull squat 1150 at uh, 260, it's like, it's up in a split second, it's ridiculous. Um, should you be doing jumps if you can't squat 2.5 uh, body weight? So two times, two and a half times your body weight? You, just depth jumps. I don't recommend, again, doing depth jumps. You know, a lot of people can't squat, you know, it's about two times body weight, he recommended for depth jumps. But you got to realize, um, he talked about top athletes uh, uh, using a meter and a quarter, which is what, Tom, you're about a 40, uh, 48 inches at the most. Mm -hmm. All right, so we, we had a friend call us up told us that his knees and back was killing him. And I, and I said, well, he said he's doing depth jumps. And how high was he jumping off of? 60. 60 yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. And so, so just don't do, I mean, I know for Chauncey, the system is very simple in physics, uh, but it's a lot better to use greater force and jump up and land softly. Again, because, you know, a training in general is hard enough on you. So you want to do training that's going to last. People say that there are no top tier raw powerlifters using conjugate. What is your response to that? Do you know of any? Well, we've only had a few, but how about we got a 905 squat, it's two 650 benches, 630, a 550, 198, how's that? And a um, 915 raw deadlift, is that good enough for you? And we don't even do it. You're, you're, all you raw lifters, you're lucky we don't do it because we'd be kicking your ass raw too. Yeah, and well, I found out about raw, uh, they're, they're, not, they're not athletic enough to wear gear. You see guys come here all the time, you can't even put a pair of briefs on them, they can't squat right. Conjugate, yeah, Tom, I want to bring this back up. Hold on here. Where did the conjugate system come from? The Soviet Union. Yeah. What was it for? Weightlifting. Was there any gear? No. Does that answer your question? Read a freaking book, guys. Just read a book, please. I beg you to read a book. Probably read the system of multi-year training, at least, uh, the fundamentals of spatial strength, and imagine the training of the weightlifter. Just please read those three books, please. It seems to me that they think they're the only sport there. This system was wrote, as you said, for, well, there are 45 different sports. 45. And the last time I thought there is no briefs, no bench shirts in boxing, kickboxing, MMA. Football. Yeah. For, you rugby. Mm -hmm. Basketball. <laughs> Everybody does it right, Tom. Mm -hmm. Ask question. Um, best way to apply a conjugate method when you can access a commercial gym. 
But re remember what I said. Uh, if they got a power rack at least, you can do pick two or three pins to break records off of in a deadlift. Stand on a two or four inch box. Use a sumo stance. Use the closed stance. There's a lot of varieties there. Same thing. Do pin presses in a power rack real high. Maybe only move the bar three inches. You know, five inches, eight inches, two inches off your chest. Close grip, medium grip, wide grip. You know, whatever. If I said five pins, I just gave you 15 new records. High box squat. Oh, because I used to do a program from Westside Barbell. It's a seven in one workout. 17, 15, 13, and 11. All right. So you got all. I would break records on all the. You know, occasionally on all these boxes. And um, so there's many. Uh, and if you got some dumbbells, you know, just so go dumbbells, incline, decline, floor press, flat. There's always something just because he makes small changes. I did this years ago, and I didn't have anything but a barbell and a power rack and some dumbbells and a, and a hyperextension bench. That's all I had. What do you recommend for freestyle wrestlers? Freestyle training. Wrestlers. Well, we do a lot of sled. We have a special um, freestyle wrestler. Well, you know, in our belt squat, we grapple it. Our belt squat is one of the best things. Tom, you answer that question. You handle all this. You, we, we've got a kid who's got fourth in the Olympic trials at Greco, right? Yeah, I think the, the biggest thing is building that GPP base of the sled for both upper and lower body. We do a lot of upper body where we're pommeling, we're holding. Um, we do a lot of weighted wheelbarrows uh, while putting the sled to. And we've actually, one of my kids came in late, not kid, but one of my fighters came in late, and I made him push a wheelbarrow, pull a sled, and have a safety squat bar. I wouldn't recommend that, but because he's in shape and got a high level of GPP, he could do it. Uh, the belt squat is the biggest asset you'll have as a coach, especially for wrestling. Why? Because it keeps you in constant tension and you're in quasi-isometric holes a whole lot of the time. But, um, and we, uh, you can do it for strength, you can do it for conditioning. Uh, box squat is huge, Zercher lifts, Zercher. Look at Alexander Karelin, a monster of a man. If you follow what he did, the Zercher lift was one of the, his biggest um, assets and he could lift anybody up. But that is huge. Zercher 40 for, for five. Yeah. Um, uh, High rep deadlift. Yep, five up. minute squats and five minute uh, power or hand clean to yep. the push press um, then speed deadlifts uh, three reps every 30 seconds for five minutes stuff like that um, again building that base GPP and the biggest thing I've noticed with fighters and wrestlers is their absolute strength is not where it should be and they have the worst admiration phase of an athlete you have it is terrible but once you start increasing that it'll be huge uh, you know the cardinal sin for a wrestler is to wear out mm-hmm so that's what the old guy said, and it's true. You can never wear out. You gotta keep bringing it. None of our guys wear out. Yeah. And as I said, the best thing is the sled. The sled mm -hmm. is the most underutilized piece of equipment, especially in combat sports. You can bring it anywhere, load it up, but you can do all over your body. That and the wheelbarrow. They're pretty simple. So increase your GPP with those and increase your strength. Um, how often would you use reverse band deadlift squats and in, and for a bench press in a training cycle? Um, we never, we seldom ever do them. I know uh, Chris does them for the power clean for the second pull. They seem to work real well. Um, I don't like reverse band. I use the same, I did it the same I did reverse band. So for me, it was no different. We use a reverse band bench occasionally just for a test. We don't feel it makes you any stronger. You gotta remember folks, if I pick up a band that takes 155 off my chest, it actually picks up 155 on the concentric. That's just the way bands work. So, you know, I see guys use slingshots and all these things. It's, if you think a slingshot, if you think a bench went on 300 pounds, you got to put a slingshot on. No, the slingshot did it, just like a bench. You know, the heaviest weights I ever used in benching was raw, not not in a shirt. Uh, but the weight in the shirt, the shirt did it all. You know, I felt the shirt. Uh, so, basically, we don't do a lot of reverse band. Although I do recommend it. Because I had colleges do it for the power clean, and all yeah. their their power cleans went way up. Mm -hmm. um, ice hockey players, uh, how would they use the system? Um, I would get this, like you said, the sled. Go look at these books, guys, and then um, all the books, the year books, and all this. A lot of uh, they use belt squats. It's called the hockey pose. You get down in a, a, a static position, hold if you want, hold your st stick, and you can be down because you can breathe in a belt squat. That's the key about the bell squad. You do all the static work and breathe. So we do a lot of that and uh, a lot of jumps. Uh, they have to have strong backs. I know in America, compared to everywhere else, uh, what I am told by top hockey players is they've got weak lower backs. Weak lower backs and hamstrings. I would do the inverse curl um, and uh, reverse hyperextensions, all stand-up leg curl, laying leg curl, band curls, all this, but live in a bell squad and tons of sled work. 
You know, Tommy, you do a lot of sled work where you have a sled behind you mm -hmm. holding the strap between your legs with your hands lower than your knees. It's a tremendous hamstring developer, and it's an ass kicker because you're bent over for 180 or wherever far you go. I recommend stuff like that for the hockey players. I think around the ankles, like you do for track, yeah. people will help for the hips. That's right, yeah. We do a lot of, uh, right, we'll strap around the ankles. And, you know, also, in general, the Soviets would just, uh, among other things, a little bit more skill, they would hit heavier pucks. What would be a, what are good exercises to perform for a youth track team? Uh, again, the sled work. I would have them power walk with sleds. I mean, in the beginning, I would get them in shape. I probably 400 meters at a time. You know, we we had a girl here uh, Monday that went. Um, oh, she's a she's a uh, 10k racer. She, in 39 minutes, she went 400 uh, meters 10 times. All right. So she had a, that's her pace. It's slightly under a four minute pace. My, uh, when she comes back tomorrow morning, we're going to sharpen that pace up. She started out a little too quick, and then slowed down a little bit. She started out in two minutes a, a, a pace. So we're going to take it up a little bit, uh, slow it down, and maintain a higher pace. So uh, I would get a good pace on them. Then for junior j jumper, they have to jump. You got to start jumping when you're young. Hopefully, I'm talking to someone here, eight and ten years is going to trade eight and ten year olds. Get them doing lots of sleds, um, lots of GPP, like setups and push-ups, gymnastics, I mean, tumbling and so forth. If you can't climb a rope, we, we hook it to a, a sled and pull it you know, while we're standing up. Anything, just uh, general exercises like that. And ball sports, having to do ball sports. I think a big thing, too, is the inverse curl. Inverse curl, we've had, um, Brian's kid, seven years old, use that machine. Yeah, he used and, it the other day. And here's another thing too, what people don't realize is uh, the Jamaican track team just okay. bought an inverse curl on bell squat from us. And a, pl and a, a uh, Ben Pension reverse hyper. Yes. Um, yeah, you bring up a good point. He just said we had a seven year old wrestler here and had quite a few matches already, right? Yeah. Yeah. And I bought him a small belt. He was in the bell squat. Mm -hmm. He's walking in the bell squat while he's mm -hmm. uh, acting like he's pummeling him and so forth. There's no, it's all traction. Uh, Tight adductor groin, any tips on on top of what you're doing already mobility-wise for a tight adductor and groin? I would personally go to ART expert. We have one in the, right in the next room here. Uh, John Quint works on us. He's here every Friday, works on somebody, or more often if we need it during the week. Uh, I would definitely do that. Work on the psoas, loosen up that psoas. There's so many posture problems in sports where you run, and that causes many, many injuries, especially lower body injuries. So you want to make sure you have perfect posture. And again, it starts in the beginning. Get a, get a hopefully, a track coach that knows what they're doing or a, or a skill coach that teaches you skill in the beginning. Always learn skill, then work on speed, strength, and endurance after that. He squats 930 at 220, oh. and his hips tuck under. You come forward? What's that, yeah. Uh, if, that's, if, you, if this is the case, I mean, I know this sounds stupid, but obviously your glutes aren't strong enough or you just got bad form. We've got a guy here doing the same thing, right, Tom? Mm -hmm. And I told him today he's got to do even more hamstring and glute work. The, the strongest muscle, I always tell you, if I smack you in the face, one time you block it thousands of times. So this, the body works. If it works correctly, chromatic chain, the strongest muscles must work first. So we take a bar, you got to stick your lower, your arch your back and stick your glutes out and, and spread your knees. And your, and your chest, everything's exaggerated. Chest out, butt out, knees out, stomach out. And that's how you correct your form. And do it quick or you're gonna get into some knee problems. How do you deal with gait issues or issues with dominance in one leg? Uh, well, if you have dominance in one leg, that's where uh, one leg jumping or plyo swing jumping on one leg, you know, bilateral deficits. Do a lot of that uh, dual pendulum. We, we one yeah, leg. we have a dual pendulum reverse hyper. I know, you know, it's cost money to buy these things. You know, that's one thing, though. Um, I tell people, they, well, I don't have the money. Well, I mean, I've got well over, well, well, well over $100,000 paying for prototypes just to make my gym stronger. And yet, the, like, the Olympic training camp can't do that and place can't do that. You know, you're going to have to spend some money if you want to go, if you want to go big time. Uh, really, a bell squat, a bell squat, uh, inverse curl, and a, um, and a, a plyo swing, and a reverse hyper, I would probably just go with the strap model. It would do wonders. It would just take time off your 40 or, or anything you're doing. And like Tom said, a sled, 150 bucks or whatever they cost, 
is just crazy what you can do with that. What would you recommend for a rugby player? Tom, we've worked with many rugby players. Why don't you take over and tell them what you did? The, it's pretty much the off season is exactly what we do here in the gym. I think uh, Dan the Pasqua does probably one of the best jobs. Um, and and Phil, uh, Phil Richards did a great job when he was doing it. But Dan the Pasqua is still with the Melbourne Storm. Um, increasing absolute strength, that's the, the main key. Uh, rugby is a push-pull sport. Um, so we work on that deadlift. Sumo deadlift is key, um, especially for athletes. Well, a strong posterior chain, lots of hypers. Uh, the biggest thing with me in rugby is the bench press is very poor. I think the average bench press for a rugby player in Europe is about 100k, which is terrible. That's not even an average for a high school athlete here. Yeah, I heard it was 120, but it's yeah. terrible. And, uh, but work on that and work on the joints. Joint integrity is huge in that sport because they don't use padding and they get hit a lot. Um, and no revs. Yeah. Train fast. Yeah. And uh, the dynamic effort day is huge. It's, it's very similar to the system, except the rest period is short. Tell me about the last rugby player came here. Yeah, what can I give his name? Stephen, uh, Stephen Moore yeah. from Australia. Yeah. He came here for three or four weeks and uh, he happened to get dropped from the team. So we had him train here. We actually increased his, uh, he had a very bad, poor flexibility in the box squad. We increased his hip flexibility, his strength, and worked with him, answered his questions. We didn't hear from him until we're watching the Rugby World Cup. Uh, the final, and he ended up becoming the captain of the Australia team. So it's <laughs> it's huge. But if if you're into rugby, I would look at what Dan the Pasqua does for the Melbourne Storm. I think he's got a, a very good idea of what the system does for rugby. The St. Louis Cardinal baseball team does this program. They won world titles uh, the, the years ago. The um, Green Bay Packers. I worked with Packers. They won this, the world title, and the coach was with the Patriots. Uh, won the world title. So this thing fits into all sports. It That's fits into all, it's, like Tom said, there's, there's two ways to train, the right way and the wrong way. There's, uh, is, and this is the only scientific me method there is. That's what I learned. Uh, after a year of being going through these books, I realized I knew nothing about science. I, I started to apply science and every, my whole world changed in front of me at that point. Is uh, sorry, just came up. Um... Doing 100 meter sprints too risky for powerlifting? Yeah, it's stupid. It's not exercise specificity. Yeah, there's no reason to do that. You're bound to pull a hamstring, there's just no doubt in my mind. If you want to be explosive, jump. You know, no powerlift lasts for 10 seconds, and that's a, a supreme runner. So you're probably doing it in 14. So just start doing some jumping. Okay, that's event to finish off on. Huh? Okay. Um, you know, do the jumping. Like I said, I like a lot of jumps. Our guys don't do them, but uh, I believe Chris, you're doing some yeah. uh, barbell jumps. Jump of a barbell. Uh, stand in the middle, jump up and land on two boxes, or stand on wide and jump up and land close. To bring your feet together on one. Uh, you know, if you watch the internet uh, and watch the Chinese, they do a lot of this. You see, Russia's doing this. You see, Russians uh, doing pin squats, crawling under the bar, concentric squats. Like we talk, we do a lot of that stuff here. Without without a, an eccentric face, so a lot of things like that. But for your uh, for your sports, I believe what lacks in sports in this country is jumps. They don't do enough jumps. You've been talking about those jumps where you start close and jump up wide with the bar on your back. Yeah. You know, my training partner and I, we did that for nine weeks, and every three weeks we would change either the bar weight based on fifty percent of our body weight and the box height. And at the beginning, with ninety five pounds on my back, I jumped to a twenty four inch box, and then nine weeks later. I jumped on a 30 and a half inch box. That's results right there. That's and right. That's, the, that's the development of power. And then during at, this, that, at the same body weight, I take it. Yeah. The, yeah. And then the same time, like I was peaking for a meet and I did a clean, 240 clean with 150 pounds of band resistance. You know, every NFL prospect that would come here, I don't really want them anymore. But they came here, a dozen of them, and I averaged three tenths in nine weeks. I never, they come here with a running time. They, they just told me what they ran. I never ran them one time. And they all, uh, I said, I took all three tenths. And my, how did I know if they could run faster, if they could jump higher? The first fellow I had uh, from uh, um, uh, Oklahoma State University, a fifth year senior, 6'5, 295, I had him for 21 days. And he had a 5'4, 40. So in nine in twenty one days he weighed three oh eight. He gave at the at the in, in Indianapolis it was three oh eight. Put thirteen pounds on and he ran a five one forty. So that just shows you I mean it's all science. It's that it's what expo explosive power is basically defined by jumping ability, is what it's defined by. Not Olympic weightlifting uh, guys. There's nothing wrong with it for sports. I'm into it, it's a little deck it's a little rough on your joints, 
but I, I've seen nothing wrong with doing power cleans or power snatches. Uh, I, I want to bring up one final point. I guess we're about done with this. But I got some girls, and uh, one's pretty strong. She's nine months. She's already 45 pounds over a pro total for women. She's done four. She's done 430 squat, 285 bench, and 385 deadlift. Well, this morning they did exactly what I said. They did the 25 squats. You know. Um, them broke the power clean records. So how did? And then he went on to the bell squad and the inverse squad. Another thing I talk about. But my point is, see, out of the clear blue sky, they got to run their mouth. These are pretty mouthy girls. So they got in the contest and he broke a record. That shows that this training is optimal. If it wasn't optimal, they couldn't break an all-time power clean record after doing 45 stressful lifts. So you got to be in shape. I. Uh, um, you know, that's uh, that's what we're trying to work on right now to get some people come here and see if, uh, my, see if they can do my recommendations, which are the Soviet recommendations, to see if these people can actually do the workloads that we want them to do. And, uh, you know, that's what we want to find out. Or I'll never, I'm not going to get any research. Lou, can you conclude oh. on where I'd you like to bring up, I mentioned before, congratulating Mark Marinelli and Stipe about winning the UFC title. And years ago, I had Kevin Randall in here as UFC heavyweight champ. But who's the heavyweight boxing champ, Tom? And what type of training do they do? Wild, Wilder. Oh, the other one, yeah, Craig Benelli. Okay. They do a lot of work with him. They do a lot of West Side stuff. So here, a world champion boxer and a world UFC heavyweight champion does this type of training. It's designed for their sport. Now, I want to commend both gentlemen for doing such a tremendous job, um, you know, on what they do. But how, you know, how did it work for that? Everyone looks, they think we're all powerlifting here. I mean, I love powerlifting. That is my life, and you know it, Tom. I really don't want nobody else, but we're in flux constantly with athletes coming here. Zia's strength. They work for John Jones. They follow. <laughs> yeah, John's not too bad. <laughs> <laughs> um, you conclude, I know there's a million books, but if someone is here really wants to know about the conjugate system, what books would you recommend them just to start off on? Well, uh, honestly, I think the multi-year training system and the fundamentals of spatial strength. Well, this read doesn't talk about the conjugate too much, or, yeah. or does it? This, it uh, talks about the difference. The manage the training of the weightlifting, I think it should be, is a parallel sister to those books. It teaches you loading. You know, if you can't do these programs, we have people, what we take, Tom, you say it all the time, like you said, people come and they can't train. What we take for granted, people can't even come in and do a standard workout with We don't try to mess anybody up. I am. Not, I would never do that in my life. Even if I hated your ass, I wouldn't do it. I I, I would come out and I say, well, just you. Know, as a matter of fact, what nine, 99 out of ninety five out of one hundred, we say, well, you're gonna have to go train with the girls. They can't even begin to train with the guys. They can't even do a, a simple workout in a, that we use three week ways. Go back three week ways. year in year out. They can't do it. And and it, and that's what I found out. I mean, it's it's the workload. Uh, people had to do the work. If you want to squat. 506, 1,000, you got to have the workload. If you want to clean jerk 450, 48, 475, 100, 500, you got to have, you got to be able to do the workload to be able to do these lists. It's just not imaginarily going to happen. It just ain't going to happen. You got to do the work. I mean, how in the hell do you go to school? I know, Tom, you're, a, you know, you have a degree. I mean, the first grade, the second, led to the second, related to graduating high school. Then you went to uh, undergrad, then you went to grad school. Everything graduates to something else where you have more, you gain more intelligence, more knowledge. Training is the same. If you just do the same training for year in, year out, you're only going to lift the same weight year in, year out. You've got to find a way the conjugate consistent is how it's done. And, um, you know, I hope that we've got that understood. That's a good point. Just on that topic, a lot of people get confused. When people are training a long time, the thing called training age, and they got a high training age and a high training density. And these people are the people that look to how to train. But these guys need very little stimulus and some things to get great gains. And we got a few of them in our gym, yep. and a few people. But these aren't the guys to follow. That's, that's, that is not going to make a, a novice athlete better. You can't pick up Men's Health magazine, look how GSP trains and become GSP. It's not going to happen. And I think that's what screws up a lot of people. That's the, this is the top of the pyramid, but they need to start at the base. Mm -hmm. I remember years ago in the weightlifting magazine, there was a guy from Poland. He had no muscles, but he's a real good lifter. And he could look, he's a muscleless wonder. But you know, the other uh, hundred thousand, I'm was jacked up like I've never seen. <laughs> I've never seen traps, lower backs, hamstrings, glutes, or qu quads to go, that these people had. But then everybody thought, oh, he has no muscle. I'll go that way. Well, it got him nowhere. You know, I, I mean, if, if, if this stock's making millions, 
I'm going with that stock. I'm not going to take his rogue stock, which I've done and lost my ass on. So, you know, uh, I'm going to go for making the money. I've just got a constant return on my money, and I want constant return on my training. Louis, Chris, thank you very much for the podcast. We will be here with you guys again next Friday. Thank you, John.